Ugh! Uh, uh, hey, hey, everybody! I uh, didn't see you come in there on uh, on account of the fact I had to um sell my eyes. Turns out that if I keep buying Yu-Gi-Oh cards, eventually I had to start like <clears throat> doing other stuff to pay for it. Some of these cards are, you know, super pretty, but at the same time, I sold my fingernails for a copy of Dark Magician. You wouldn't think there was a market for that sort of thing, but uh, lo and behold, there is. Jokes on them, though. I actually just sent them toenails. As a result, I've had to downsize a bit, and now we're living in Casa de Statute. But I plan on keeping life going as per usual. Of course, some of my day-to-day -day activities are a little simpler now. Uh, brushing my teeth is out of the question since I sold them all for a copy of Ancient Gear Fusion. And personal hygiene is out since I can't smell anymore. Don't think it's all doom and gloom, however, because I've managed to find other ways to keep myself entertained. Jackbox. The game sensation that's sweeping the nation. The only thing that's sweeping the nation. I've been playing this more and more ever since I sold all my worldly possessions, since all you need to do is play with your phone. I'd rather sell my foot before I'd sell my phone, which I did, but look at how nice my dinosaur deck looks. Now I just sort of spend my time punching in random room codes and hoping that I find a game. As such, I've got a bit of a handle on which games I like and which ones I don't. With that, today I wanted to go over my top 5 favorite and least favorite Jackbox games. As for some rules, this list is based on my opinions and experiences with each of the games. I'm someone who has experience playing all of these games with a close-knit group of friends. We tried all of them at least once, and we have our own list of must-plays and never-plays. Also, simply because of how these games work, games with sequels like Fibbage and You Don't Know Jack will all have their games lumped into one entry. As from experience, these sorts of games tend to just be updated versions or visual switch-ups. Also, if at any point you see me on uh, TCG Player on my phone, uh, there's probably a blunt object around here that you can hit me with to get me to stop, um, but if not, your fist should work too, I have a jaw of glass. Before we get into the list proper, I want to give an honorable and dishonorable mention to games that are just good enough to not be bad, or just bad enough to not be good. The one too good to be bad is Bidiots, hailing from Jackbox Party Pack 2. Here's the thing, if you have a group of people who all understand how this game works, you'll have a jolly old time. If you're someone like me and my friends who didn't get it immediately, you're in for an awful time. The first time that we played this game, one of my friends wasted all their money up front because they didn't get the game, and just sulked in the corner for the rest of the time. Then, when they got back in with a predatory loan, they still didn't understand, despite watching us play the whole time. Bidiots requires a little too much setup, I feel, when the rest of Jackbox is all about easy to pick up and play games that even my tech illiterate parents picked up after the end of their first game. After that is the game Too Bad To Be Good, ironically hailing from the exact same Jackbox, Bomb Corps. This game, along with another one, is very out of the wheelhouse of the usual snarky and drawing style Jackbox games. Having a cooperative game is a great way to get your foot into the water of other social multiplayer games. It's very similar to Keep Talking and No One Explodes, but when it gets spicy is when you get instructions that require you to disregard other people's instructions. Then the tension in the room shifts from We Gotta Defuse This Bomb to No, He Doesn't Know What He's Talking About, Listen To Me! Bombcore handles the idea of an atypical Jackbox game perfectly, and honestly nearly justifies a phenomenally weak box all on its own for that fact. I think the only thing holding it back is its four-player cap. The chaos of any more people is potentially too much, but just imagine what it would be like with eight or potentially more people squawking as one person desperately tries to wrangle everyone back to pay attention to the fact they're trying to defuse a bomb. The number five worst Jackbox game is Joke Boat, hailing from Jackbox 6. It's a shame that the Nuclear Art Deco style game of this box had to be one of the weakest fill-in-the-blanks games Jackbox has ever seen. What's sad is that this game nails the aesthetic that it wants to go for, which is key to any successful Jackbox game. Some okay games are buoyed by their great visual designs, and other great games are sunk by their bland layout. Sadly, Joke Boat's delightful visual design is not enough to save its lackluster gameplay. It starts out with everyone submitting as many topics as they can muster within a time limit, before they are then given a prompt that they use those topics to fill in like a Mad Lib. After that, it's all up to you to figure out the punchline for your Frankenstein's joke that you've written. What I don't like about this game is that unlike a game like Quiplash or Fibbage, the format that you have to fit your particular answers into is a lot more restrictive. In those games, there's so much wiggle room for what you want to write, but in this one, having to fit into the nature of a setup and punchline joke means that you're going to have to be a lot more particular and a lot less funny. The portion where the actual jokes get told is more awkward than anything. Imagine the presentation portions of Survive the Internet or TKO, where you had an unfunny prompt that gets no laughs. That's what joke boats like all the time, this is the joke equivalent of a child-sized coffin. The final round is a little better off seeing as you get something a lot more interesting in the form of having to try and fix your friend's jokes, but the most fun that we had honestly was trying to make the least funny jokes and delivering them with supreme confidence. Like all of these games, you can find some worth in it, but for my money, I'm not touching it again. The fifth best game is fighting out of the best Jackbox number three, and it's TKO. 
TKO is from the genre of games I think Jackbox does best, the art games. With one or two exceptions, the drawing games are always the standout from the rest of the lineup, as you'll see later on in this very list. But TKO being the worst of the best shouldn't take away from this game at all. First off, it's the first game in the series to let you pick an avatar. Not a big deal or anything, but all the character choices are so cute that I often find myself swapping between them to see which one I like best. Although I am a hardcore Raven main, and if you take him, I will take your life! After everybody enters the game, you have a short, and I mean short, amount of time to draw three pictures, which will be placed on shirts. After that, you'll get another short amount of time to write as many taglines or slogans for those shirts as you can think of. The kicker is that after you get the last of your stuff in, you're doled out a random combination of phrases and drawings from everybody else. From there, you cobble together some horrible mess and send it off to be judged. After that, you draw one more picture and more slogans, then you do it again. Then the winners from each round are voted on to see who is the super champion. This game has so many facets that make it enjoyable, and results will vary depending on who you play with, like all Jackbox games. First and foremost, and what I think makes the Jackbox drawing games the best, is the best artist doesn't always win. As someone who fancies themselves art literate, that should be infuriating that my Homer Simpson that I spent so much time on got beaten out by a creeper drawn by a toddler. But that's part of the charm. Jackbox works best when you get to see the people around you react, whether it's with anger or laughter or even sadness. There's no quicker way to get all three of those emotions at once than by dashing their hopes with a picture of a minion with the subtitle Perish Weakling. The quick nature of the game also lends itself to getting over those emotions and moving on to the next joke. TKO is a great exercise in emotional range, as the pure randomness of the format allows any emotion to shine through. And artists who have their art used by a winner can still take pride in the fact that they won using their art. The one problem with TKO is its reliance on shock value. Often a sure who's funny in round one won't be as funny in the second round and positively dead in the third round. It makes it so hard for players who have to go first to go the distance unless everybody else got crap. Regardless, however, TKO still stands up as one of the biggest crowd pleasers in all the Jackboxes and is one everyone can enjoy. I feel bad for ragging on Jackbox 4 because it's got some gold in there, like Survive the Internet and Fibbage 3, but the more you think about it, the more you can understand why people call it one of the weakest boxes. Especially with number 4, Bracketeering. So what is Bracketeering? I'll tell you. It's a game with the biggest disparity between aesthetics and content. This neon 80s cyberpunk robot and alien style is everything I want and more. This may be one of my favorite visual designs in any Jackbox game, which is going to make the next part all the sadder. In Bracketeering, you will be given a prompt that will be used in a bracket with a unifying theme. Let's say it's like, name a vegetable. Then everyone votes on which one they like best, and then the winner wins. It is disgustingly straightforward for a series that prides itself on the bizarre and out there. It gets better in the next round where after entering an answer, the prompt changes so now you have to justify your old choice with the new prompt. After that is the triple blind round, where it changes every single round, which is the best part of the game. The problem is that this is the third part of the game. The first two rounds are slogs because shock value answers lose their appeal very quickly, and the fact that absolutely no spice is added to shake things up to the very, very similar Quiplash is shocking. What you have here is a very pretty looking, dumbed down version of Quiplash that overstays its welcome. I'd like to see them tackle a sequel that attempts to emulate more of what the third round accomplishes, rather than just making a pick the funny one type game when Quiplash is just that, but a lot better. After that is the most recent game on the list from the most recent game, and probably the best drawing game in any Jackbox, Champed Up from Jackbox 7. Champed Up is TKO taken to its logical conclusion, that being pitting drawings against each other taken very literally. In Champed Up, you are given a prompt and must draw a character based on it as well as give them a name. Then after that, your opponent will get your picture with the name and has to draw a character based on what they think the prompt was. After that, your drawings duke it out, with everyone else voting on who got closer to the prompt. They don't know who's the original and who's the copy. Then in the next round, after more drawing, a new prompt that you didn't have any idea would come is announced, and you either choose to keep in your drawing, or tag out your old drawing who may fit the prompt better. This creates a wonderful self-contained humor to champ up, where suddenly it all becomes about callback humor, and you have to think ahead about what you're sending out, and if it's worth it since it might not be as funny as you think. Drawings that die to death in round one can find a new life in round two. The best part is that like the junior suffixes in Trivia Murder Party or the Crown and Quiplash, you can tag in drawings from previous games in order to fight for you. Now it suddenly becomes a game of amassing a stable of funny drawings over the whole night, giving them personalities and story, all in an attempt to win the crown. In that way, it emulates the fantastic pro wrestling art style very well. Champed Up is a masterstroke when it comes to the drawing genre, and stacks up even better when you take into account that Six for some odd reason skipped a drawing game the year before.
The third worst game in all of Jackbox is from the positively anemic Jackbox 2 with Earwax. I have a tragic story to tell you about this game. One that I think will shock and dishearten a lot of you. This game is one of my group's favorites. I know, I know, but please, they're simple folk. They laugh at fart jokes and gunshots, as we all do from time to time. But that's about all that Earwax has to offer. Earwax is essentially Cards Against Humanity, but with sounds, and in the actually sad story, I think Cards Against Humanity is overrated. But like, a lot. I think that it's all edgy shock humor without the endearing wit that comes from the tamer apples to apples. There are so many times when you hear the same dirty jokes over and over and over, and by that point it just loses its charm. Then you spend the whole time in between games thinking about the few funny jokes and convincing yourself that it's a funny game. Back to Earwax, however. It has all the edge of Cards Against Humanity without any of the actually funny responses. You're given a set list of sounds at random and are told to respond to a prompt given to every player. You then use two sound effects that best fit the prompt. The problem with this is the fact that there are only probably about 10 or 15 poop and fart and gunshot sounds, which essentially act as automatic wins whenever played, because all the other sounds are just instruments and animal noises or mundane phrases. Without one of these stupid answers, you'll be left with nothing worthwhile, and you'll basically have to burn a turn just to get things moving. It then just repeats three times with no variation between rounds. It gets really dull really quick. Worse yet is the uninspired visual design. The Tamagotchi-style character portraits are cute and all, but that's all that you're looking at for the whole time. It's also something I haven't mentioned until now, but the host is really lackluster. The robotic voice rarely says anything funny, and honestly, who would just use a robotic voice to read out their text? I'm sorry if this segment comes off as short, but this game is so basic there's nothing to talk about. Number 3 hails from Jackbox number 5 with Madverse City. The cunning linguists in your friend group will finally be able to flex their muscles if they aren't the funniest or best artist. This game, above all others, rewards clever wordplay. In this game, you assume the role of a giant mech who has a rap battle with other giant mechs, all the while destroying a city. Already, this is a fantastic concept for a game, but it gets better. To start things off, you have to fill in a random prompt, be it adjective, verb, food, anything could potentially be what you fill in. Then after that, you're shown a full verse of a rap with your word placed in it. Now it's up to you to write a whole new verse for the end of the rap. Repeat that one more time and you're off to the races. After that is the hysterical portion where a robot will wrap your verse with an awful text-to-speech voice. There are some beautiful moments where you realize how clever some of your friends' disses are, and even more fantastic moments when everyone acknowledges how you've torn them asunder with superior witty dialogue. It's one of the most simple games from the standpoint of how you win, but in terms of actually getting to that point, it requires a whole different level of thinking. It takes you into the mind of somebody making up freestyle off the top of their head, because that's what you're doing. You have to make up something complex enough to be impressive, while not so complex that you stump yourself into trying to think of a rhyme for it. Madverse City will test you in ways no other writing game will, and I can't get enough of it for that. Sticking around the fifth box for just a little bit longer, and if you know Jack, you know what's next. It's Zeeple Dome. What is... Zeeple Dome? Well, to answer that question, you need to understand that Jackbox games usually fall into either lying, writing, guessing, or drawing games. This is the formula that so many games follow, and with the exception of Bomb Corp and The Devils in the Details, it's hard to call them traditional games. They're much closer in DNA to pub trivia with theatrics. By contrast, Zeeple Dome is just a video game. Your phone is the controller, you fling spacemen around the screen, it's so much different to every other Jackbox game, and unlike Bomb Corp, which at least shares the shouting and communication aspect that so many Jackbox games have, Zeeple Dome is just a video game. That sounds like a really weird negative, but trust me, when you're going through You Don't Know Jack, Madverse City, Split the Room, and Patently Stupid before getting to Zeeple Dome, you see how badly it sticks out like a sore thumb. This has no business being in a Jackbox. I appreciate the attempt to do something different and give us something that isn't like any other Jackbox game ever made, but at the same time, come on, it at least has to feel a little bit like it was made by the same people. Zeeple Dome feels like a mobile game that they had half-baked and slapped into five because they were one game short on this pack. Zeeple Dome may be the one game that me and my friends bulked out on mid-game, just because we realized how unfun it was. It's enough to make some people disregard 5 entirely based on how awful it is, which really isn't fair because I'd say it's in the top 4 or maybe even 3 party packs. But still, avoid Zeeple Dome. Coming up next with the silver medal is Quiplash, the most used Jackbox game as it appears in boxes 2, 3, and 7, only matched by Fibbage. Quiplash is probably the most famous game to ever come out of any Jackbox. If you've ever seen a streamer or a YouTuber play Jackbox, 
they've played Quiplash, because it's simple but so much fun. Quiplash is a lot like Cards Against Humanity, except instead of having preset responses, you get to write in whatever you want. Then you simply put your answer up against someone else who had the same prompt. These games are always some of the most fun. There are no fancy gimmicks, no funny twists, it's your answer against someone else's. This sounds like a bit of a hypocritical statement since I've bashed other games for being simple, but the difference between something like this and Bracketeering is that Quiplash doesn't claim to be anything more. It's a very simple and a very basic game. The only spice that's added is in the third round and in the art style of Quiplash 3. The third round of Quiplash is always what's held it back from being the best game, because it always kind of stinks. Quiplash 2 has to be the worst one though. Acrolash, Comiclash, and Wordlash always make sure that the game will end on a wet fart. Speaking of the art style of Quiplash 3, however, the claymation backgrounds are hypnotically pretty and add an element of style that Quiplash has always struggled with. Last round notwithstanding, Quiplash is the pinnacle of Jackbox's wordsmithing gameplay and is sure to entertain no matter which one you get. But um, but really, just get two or three because it's no coincidence that the two boxes with Quiplash are also the best boxes. Finally, The Wooden Spoon, the worst Jackbox game and to no one's surprise it comes from Jackbox Party Pack 1. Word Spud. Word Spud is the closest Jackbox has come to emulating an un-game. This game has negative fun value. It's one of the only games you could accurately emulate with just a whiteboard. Word Spud is a game that lacks every single aspect of a Jackbox game that makes them Jackbox games. Word Spud tasks you with writing a word, then people vote on if it's a good word. If you get enough votes, you get points, then the next person writes a word. It goes on until everybody drops dead. Word Spud is flat out awful. Even Zeeple Dome had thought put into the level design and art style. Bracketeering, Earwax, Joke Boat can all at least get a giggle. Word Spud will never get a laugh. Ever, I assure you. Unless you just like writing horse penises, but that's a trump card, it's cheating. Just skip the whole first pack. All the games have either been updated, or you can buy them separately. Finally, number one, the best Jackbox game originating from three and six is Trivia Murder Party. Understand that for the rest of this entry, I'll mainly be talking about Murder Party 1 because it's the one I have the most experience with, but everything I say here applies to Murder Party 2 since it's just more trivia Murder Party. Despite the Jackbox Party Pack being named after the classic You Don't Know Jack games that were the company's bread and butter for years, it's Trivia Murder Party that I think is the zenith of the trivia games. Let's start off with the aesthetics because the atmosphere of this game is perfect. Everything about it is so wonderfully macabre and cheesy like the horror movies that inspired it, and the host is such a big boon, being a serial killer who just wants to be a fun game show host. Trivia Murder Party seems like a simple game at first, just standard trivia questions, but the game heats up when you get a question wrong. Then you're sent to the killing floor, where you get to play a mini-game in order to survive. If you win, you're back in the game. If you lose, however, you die and get turned into a ghost. Ghosts keep earning points when they get questions right, and aren't sent to the killing floor when they get questions wrong. After only one player remains, the game goes into the final round where it's rapid fire questions, and each question gets you closer to escaping. However, if a ghost manages to catch up to you, they steal your body and progress in your place. The tension in this final round is so absolute that you spend the whole time praying that you know the next question so you can make that explosive comeback. What makes Trivia Murder Party so good is the fact that it manages to balance the trivia with creating a fun experience with the Killing Floor minigames, which always create a big ruckus and shouting match when you just barely escape or backstab someone to get them out of the game. Every game of Trivia Murder Party is its own self-contained experience, compounded by the fact that when you play more than one game in a row with the same people, everyone who died is called Junior because your original character died, but the survivor doesn't have that tag because they're still alive. The detail and love that went into Trivia Murder Party is so obvious that a pack that I'm not a huge fan of in 6 is saved by having its sequel, and a part of the reason I love 3 so much is thanks to Trivia Murder Party. I can't think of any other game that's given me as many soaring highs, crushing lows, and creamy middles as this one, which is why I say it's the best Jackbox game. Well, glad that that's over. Happy I could really open up about something that I care about, because honestly, Jackbox means a lot to me. When I was first going into college, I had no friends and didn't know anyone, but then through playing Jackbox, I got to know a lot more people. I got to have a lot of fun experiences, meet good friends that I still have to this day. Those are memories that I wouldn't trade for anything. Well, unless I could, like, trade them for money so that I could buy more. I'm gonna check real quick. What the f*** is a Jackbox?